let's see here. All right. Let's do this. We are we're rocking and rolling. We're live right now. Okay. <clears throat> you ready to go, bro? Yeah, yeah. I'm just watching some R- Rodney Mullen prodigy go off right, right now. But I'm down. Let's go. Let's go. If you're looking for the most amazing podcast ever, well, this isn't it. You're listening to The Average Fellas Podcast, guaranteed to let you down and leave you unsatisfied. intro right there that's what i'm talking about that's what i'm talking about what is going on ladies and gentlemen this is episode 004 of the average fellas podcast what's going on moon none mine Stu. just woke up i'm just waking uh, up huh i got that cup of joe right now boy a cup of wawa with me right now I got that cup of joe. Um, hey, uh, if you guys are out there listening right now, uh, we're live. We're live on Facebook. We're just doing a test. We'll see how this goes today. We might not do this. We're just seeing if it, if it can happen. Yeah. Anyways. Hey, what'd you do this weekend? Did you work? <clears throat> I worked uh three stressful days i don't want to talk about it okay yeah yeah hey you know something cool that happened for me this weekend um i actually drove by gold base you know gold base is gold base? yeah gold base no. it's a uh, it's a uh, actually it's solid gold. i would it would have been cool if it was but it's kind of underwhelming um actually it's uh it's it's the west coast based for scientology it's like we're all the. It's like their headquarter for all the big wigs of Scientology. It's like twenty minutes from my apartment, and I, uh, I went and I, I drove by. Be, it. be careful with that. Oh yeah, no, no, I just drove by. I'm not definitely not 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 getting into that. But I just drove by. Uh, interesting though, interesting uh, thing to drive by and and kind of see. Um, and I've seen a few of the buildings, seen a few of their churches around here in SoCal already in Hollywood. Some of the churches of Scientology. Uh, yeah, so that was a fun fact for this weekend. My wife and I just took a drive. We we're like, get out of the house. Sometimes we do that. Can't go nowhere, so we just drive. <laughs> um, yeah, Part of the problem. Well, it's not like we were participating in anything. We just took a drive and came home. It's not like we got out and shook hands with people or, you know, went in any place in public. Anyways, yeah, so that was my mm. weekend. That was my weekend. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, let's uh, let's get into it, guys. Uh, right now, uh, today is July twenty seventh, and you know what time it is? It's time for this week in history. Or this day in history. Oh gosh, that was that was loud again. I just need to just I just need to stop. <laughs> I'm just over killing people's ears. Oh man. Anyways, this week in history. Uh cool cool thing. Uh July 27th. I was, you know, looking into this and a uh, really cool story came up. And on July 27th there was a battle called the Battle of Prospects Bluff, and it was a a, a brief destructive siege that took place on a, a little fort that was uh overlooked uh, Apalachicola Apachicola River, I think, in Florida. It was a, a a base that was left by the British and um, 
the residents there were made up of uh, ex-slaves, people that escaped slavery, and uh, and also free freed uh, freed Africans uh, Americans also made their way because it was a place where they could find refuge, and uh, they also were there. There also there's a lot of natives there. There was the uh, uh, how, do, how do you say it again, uh, Alex? I can't remember. Right. Uh, Choctaw. Choctaw. Chakata, I believe how you pronounce it. Um, yeah. You know, Chakata t- tribe. Um, they were residents there as well, and um, and that was a, a a safe place for them. And uh, what happened is that uh, General Andrew Jackson and his boys decided that uh, we want to go cause a ruckus. And what happened is that the uh, the residents there they decided to defend themselves. The cool thing is that the British left a bunch of. Uh, you know, cannons, a fully stocked armory. So they de- uh, decided to take up their own weapons and defend themselves. And I thought, wow, that's a pretty American story, right? People defending themselves from their own government. And I think it's a story that should be heard. Anyways, unfortunately, it came to a an end because uh, Andrew Jackson decided to shoot um, to shoot at the uh, the armory where they ignited a powder magazine that d- uh, actually blew the entire four up, killing over two hundred and seventy people instantly. So, crazy story. That was today, July 27th. Wow. Crazy wow. story, right? Yeah. It's Anyways. A lot of history you don't know about that aren't told that you, in books. Yeah, that you don't hear. Schools. That is a fascinating story, and I would have loved to learn that, but I didn't hear that at all, you know? So, yeah. Anyways, hey, um, why don't we just run over uh, and get into the numbers? I think this is a cool segment that we wanted to start doing. Uh, we just kind of talk about <clears throat> the downloads and stuff uh, because we're appreciative and we're thank. We just want to say thank you, and uh, it's something that is just to me it's it's incredible to see the response that we've been getting. And so I just want to shout you guys out, uh, those listeners uh, on on the different platforms. So that's a hope you guys you know like this information too. But I do, anyways. Hey, why don't you give us a total downloads, Moon? It was uh, for all three episodes where we hit one sixteen total. One hundred sixteen downloads. Wow! Thank you, guys. That's awesome. That is great. Yep, yep. How many Apple Podcast listeners do we have out there? Or what's that? What's that? Can you give me the breakdown of that? Like, who's? Uh, I don't have it in front of me. It's all you, my dude. Let me see here. Okay, so I got 42% of those as Apple listeners, Apple podcast listeners. Spotify, oof, 18%. Still in third place, though. Still in third place. Our first episode reached 50 downloads. That's pretty cool. Uh, That's awesome. And uh, the last most recent episode with our our last guest, comedian Ivan Garcia of the Ivan in Space podcast, 31 downloads. That is awesome. Uh, if you guys didn't get a chance to check it out, go take a listen to that episode. Uh, it was really fun, really cool to catch up with Ivan. Uh, great guy, fun, fun comedian. So, yeah, take a look at that. Anyways, yeah, thank you guys for the listens. That's something that we, uh, we appreciate. I appreciate it. Um, <clears throat> appreciate it. I appreciate you. <laughs> Anyways, uh, I think something that I want to kind of talk about today on today's episode before we get into what we really wanted to talk about um, is what is the average fellas podcast? You might be listening right now and you're thinking, what are you listening to? What am I listening to? Is it just, you know, Zach telling stories? That's probably what it'll most likely be. I'm sorry, Moon. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Um, but, but really the average fellas podcast, uh, what we're hoping it is, is, is going to be more like a variety show that's hosted by myself and moon. And, uh, we'll feature different guest interviews, um, different media segments that we, uh, just stuff that we find interesting stuff that is, uh, relevant to us and our lives and the things that we, uh, think other people might be interested in. So it's a lot. I mean, I think the show's Hopefully, we'd like to kind of model it after a late night show, kind of like Craig Ferguson or Jimmy Fallon. I think it'd be kind of fun. Um, Hopefully, that's the vibe you guys are getting from me. (laughs) I hope so. Um, Yeah, that's kind of sort of how we want to 
what we want to do with the show, our hopes and dreams, I guess, of how we want to style the show, at least. Um, and secondly, who is the average fellas podcast for? Um, and yeah, the who is it for is a is a is a huge for thing. me. <laughs> for me only, my ego. Feed it to me. Feed it to me. I, I yeah. So, anyways, <laughs> who's it for? Uh, I hope it's not just for your ego because it's not for mine. Um, or at least I hope it's some sort of therapy for my ego because uh, I think there's a little bit of that in everybody, right? Uh, anyways, but uh, what do you mean by night? I think that everybody has a little bit of an ego. Everybody kind of is, you know, into themselves at some level. I'm egoless, dude. <laughs> Okay. Anyways, but uh, who is the average fellas podcast for? Uh, I think I, I this is just generally speaking. I think I, I hope you would agree with this moon that my our hope is for that um, that we would be able to facil- facilitate some sort of place where we'd have respected conversations with people, um, like not shaming yep. or judging one another uh, based on our you know the conversation that we're having but we want to be able to have a place where we can hear real people with real stories that's important to me be open-minded be open-minded to it right and and i'm not asking anybody to change their life's view on anything i'm not asking people to you know jump on board a whole different you know whatever train i'm getting on kind of thing that's not the point that's not the case we what we're really trying to do is just have conversations with real people and hear real stories because i think when you a lot of times we like to assume we know somebody does that make sense to you alex yep. yeah because i i feel like that a lot of times i feel like I, and i'm guilty of this all the time i'm so guilty of stereotypical stuff you know and um but my hope is that some way that we can hopefully let this show bridge be a bridge between us and other people and be able to have conversations and put those sorts of uh, things as secondary issues. You know, let's just have a conversation because that's really what, what I want to do. And uh, this leads me to my next thing is that next week we're featuring some of our friends uh, that we met in South Korea three years ago. We met some awesome people in South Korea and I'm going to tell you how this, how this friendship started because, uh, these are friends that I've been following on Facebook, Instagram now for three years now. And how our friendship started was, Hey, we're going to go get some food with somebody we just met. Do you want to come with us? Because we don't know where we're at and we don't speak the language. That's kind of how the conversation started. And it was like, Hey, I'm kind of in the same boat. Let's go get some food. And that kind of led to, you know, the unlikely conversations or the unlikely, you know, friendship that we, that, you know, we don't have, you know, because it's, we met worlds apart, decide to have a conversation and eat some food with that, putting all the other, where are you from? What's this, what's that behind you? And it, and, and then these people just become great friends. I love like, uh, just following their, you know, their social media stuff is there's brilliant people. I'd love to have on that. We're going to have them on next week, uh, which he's, reminds he's me. A lurker. What's he's that? A lurker. He's a lurker and a stalker. No, I'm not. Oh my God. Well, I'm, I find, I think some of their posts are fascinating. So, uh, if you are the friends that I'm talking about, they're from Alaska. Okay. This is why their social media is so fascinating because they're from Alaska and they post ridiculous things that only people from Alaska understand. And that's why they, I want them on the show is because their, their stories and their experience is special. And I, I really want to hear about it. You know what I'm saying? Does, is, I hope that, I hope that's the way you feel about it. <laughs> um, but yeah, that's next week's episode. And because our friends are from Alaska, um, they we we have to record the episode at a different time. And so uh, our episode's going to be posted really late in the evening, um, only because uh, the time difference between uh, California and Alaska and jobs and, and other things. So it'll be posted late, but it'll still be posted on Monday. That's next week's episode, guys. So yeah. Be sure to follow, subscribe, all those good things. You know what to do. We're on all the major platforms for podcasting. Okay. <sighs> I think we got through it all. Did we get through? <laughs> How long was that? 
Oh man, that's fifteen. Hour. That was fifteen. That's le- not le- less than fifteen minutes. All right, less than fifteen minutes. I do. Oh man, <laughs> less than fifteen minutes. Anyways, <laughs> um, yeah. So today, a little different. It's just gonna be uh, Moon and I, and uh, we're just gonna kind of talk to something talk about something really uh near and dear to our hearts so i don't know if you want to talk about that real quick moon bring us into that yeah today we decided since it's just me and you we wanted to talk about our music um basically our music life because we've been basically in the music game for since we were in junior high so we thought it'd be cool to like kind of talk about where we came from with music and not just talk about video games all day. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, I mean, that's something that's relevant to us. Something that we want to incorporate in the show kind of often, hopefully we'll get artists on the show and maybe we'll continue to demonstrate some of our, you know, what we've put together and what we've worked on. We do have a project called Lions Among Men that we've been working on um, that we're currently trying to put together the vocal for, but I'm lazy. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh, man, I'm such an average fella. Jeez. <clears throat> uh. Anyways, Moon, uh, what what thing inspired you uh, to kind of start with music or to like what where did you start with music before you even picked up an instrument because i think i feel like sometimes our music i think it's sometimes it starts before the instrument or sometimes it is the instrument but like what really inspired you with music me was definitely started with the instrument um cuz when i growing up i we had music in the house but it was like very just a clean you know the generic hispanic household you play music to clean um So there wasn't anything until I started to pick up the guitar and I started really embracing all these types of music. So it was, it was a crazy kind of journey for me at the beginning. I kind of, I kind of wish I could just like forget about it and then kind of relive it again, you know? So, so you're saying that, uh, before you actually, before you even got into like different before you broaden your like musical like horizon as far as like listening and and and, and knowing different artists uh it, the guitar really expanded that for you because you picked up the instrument is that what you're telling me yeah wow yeah because i because music back then was just something that kind of filled the space in the room like kind of like how sometimes people just put the tv on in the background it's like they're not watching it it's just kind of there that's what music was for me until I kind of picked up the guitar for the first time. And then I was like trying to learn how to play music. And then I started my, I remember my dad gave me his old like radio. And so I would put that like right behind my bed and just like have my headphones in and just listen to music like all night. It was like the, the radio, I can't remember the radio station, but yeah, definitely after I picked up the guitar for the first time is when like I kind of opened up the music. Yeah, started I mean, like embracing the emotion and the feelings and what what age would you, know, you say that was? Again? Did you say um, was? no, it was what it was the summer before seventh grade. So whatever age you are going into seventh grade is the age I was when I picked up the guitar. Mm. I want to say twelve. Uh, I say thirteen, fourteen, probably 13, right there. 14? Yeah, yeah, uh, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, it was like the it was like a month before going into school is when I picked it up and then I I got into a bunch of bad crowds and started listening to metal music, to Satan's music. <laughs> Satan's and, music, uh, brother. That brother. I, I didn't I, that that was not fun that night because it's like all I was listening to was metal, like kind of was shoehorned into it. But it's like secretly I was it was like this weird double life I was living. It was funny because I was like, most of my friends at the time are all metalheads, right? Yeah. But I was at home listening to like Earth, Wind, and Fire, The Beatles. That's Queen, what I'm talking about. Yeah, you know Prince. But like, yeah, Prince. Oof. I was listening to all these bands, but none of them knew about it because I was kind of embarrassed for them to know that I like these yeah. type of music. You I know, I like I Whitney Houston. Oof. Whitney Houston's my girl. But like at the time, I was just, it was just like, somebody. yeah, everyone just liked metal music at that time, and then. 
I felt like that metal music held me back a lot during my. I you know what I I kind of agree with I I I just see what you're saying because I remember um I started playing music probably I want to say around eight or nine years old when is when I first got my first guitar and my uncle he gave me one of those classic uh, uh Spanish acoustics that has the nylon strings right. And uh, there was a, there was a hole in the so back. Nice. He picked it up at a swap meet for like I don't know twenty five bucks or something. I don't I'm not sure what the story is. All I know is I I got it for free. It was my first guitar. My uncle gave it to me, and uh, man, bless his heart, I it sent me on a trajectory that I could not imagine uh, where I'd be at today. And it was just out of hey, I got this guitar. Do you want it? And just sort of, I didn't even ask for it. He just gave it to me. I th- they just gave it to me, you know, my uncle, my aunt did. Because yeah. my uncle's, he played guitar. My my cousin, his son, he played guitar. And, um, you know, they just had an extra one. They just passed it down to me. And at that time, music in my house, like, it was the same as you. Earth, Wind, and Fire. Um, geez, all the, all the classics, you know. My mom liked Journey. She liked classic rock, you know. So my dad had a lot of, a lot of, uh, the Bay Area sort of sound, and my mom really liked the uh, the classic rock, seventies rock. So a lot of different influences. But going into junior high, high school, if you so as much as said that you you know liked listening to Motown, you were whack. <laughs> it was either you liked metal or you liked some form of hip hop or rap. Yeah, that was it. Pretty. Like, much I don't even think pop music was that popular during that time until like In Sync and all that shit kicked off, which I do really like In Sync. But it was like this closeted. I love In Sync, Backstreet Boys shit. Yeah, this I love catchy. Oh, pop music forever will have a part in my in my life. As much as people want to, I mean, I'm talking like pop music. I'm going back Paula Abdul kind of pop music. You know, what I'm saying like yeah. good stuff that people don't recognize. Or that kids now are talking about the 90s. These kids are like, oh, my God, the 90s. And they want to dress like it. Man, don't even get me started. You want those uh, Jinko pants? Yeah. It was real bad. The 90s I, style was really bad. Okay, this kind of gets me. I know, I know this is probably something I didn't. we didn't want to get into today, but I think it's probably relevant now that we're talking about it. I listened to Logic's new record. Mm. And to me... People are say, calling him like this profound artist because of his last record, right? Because of the whole entire uh, track that he did that was about, you know, social awareness and about suicide and stuff. And they're calling him a profound artist. And I and I get what they're saying. I feel like his message is profound. His message is good a lot of the times, right? But on this new record that he put out, um, I just think I'm thinking like as talent wise, I don't. I don't think he's a great MC. Okay. I think as a social awareness individual, he's doing a good job. Does that make sense? Mm-hmm. So that's all my take on his new record. Um, Cause yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I like those old school guys like Biggie, you know what I'm saying? Like I'll put Biggie on all the time, you know, <clears throat> to me, that's like one of my, any, one of my favorite, you know, one of my favorite rappers alive. Or maybe I'm sorry, a, ever not immortal live, technique. ever. <laughs> immortal technique Mine was a immortal technique was like one of the bigger ones for me. Yeah, yeah. But he's, see, a, he's a Peruvian rapper too, so it was really cool. Yeah, that is cool. That's like a <clears throat> yeah. But anyways, yeah, like like we were talking about, like just kind of not being able to really enjoy all of our music because of the thoughts that we had about it. are the friends, other groups of people that you know didn't really didn't take a liking to it or it was kind of crazy if i think about it they probably had stuff like that too they, oh they, they did they for do. sure i'm pretty sure i wasn't the only one like oh, i'm pretty sure all. i had really, really like and i could see it now what the way they act the way they feel a little bit more free because they're not like just restricted to a genre it doesn't even have to matter if it's metal or rap or hip-hop it's just uh, um shout because out to- it, it was about being in clicks and being yeah with people and trying to be um as relevant as you can. Uh, and I, I think that's still a thing today, but it's a little bit more open. And that's, yeah, exactly. And that's, I mean, it's, I, I'm hoping that's, what, I'm hoping that'll happen, especially with music, you know, music, there shouldn't be a reason for you not to want to listen or understand, uh, uh, you know, a genre of music. Uh, yeah. People, people have fears with music. Like, um, I'll say, dude, 
I like K-pop. I think it's good. There's a lot of great songs. Just because I, of I love me some it. Dean, boy. Yeah, you like Dean, dude. Like, <laughs> you know, people people are too scared to say what they like now. Yeah, and it's I think that's a big problem because it, that's something I went through growing up, and then um, I just don't care anymore. I don't care if people. Yeah, know what I like and don't like. Well, that's the thing too about that's the thing kind of about this podcast too is like sharing a bit of us, the things that we're interested in, and the thoughts that we have about certain subjects and stuff, and and being I guess vulnerable with that because we're posting it now, so it's kind of like all right, there it is, um, and you know you hope you hope people can understand or at least be reasonable with you know your your perspective on it. Yeah, but plus it's real quick. Too, that's the thing. So your 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 opinion on like a certain artist could change. Yeah, too. No, that's true. Like I didn't like Justin Bieber for the longest time, very not because true. it was a meme to hate him. It's just I didn't. I felt his music was very dishonest and very. It he it's like he's reading off of something instead of him expressing himself. And now I feel like his later stuff, he's gotten a lot better at expressing yeah. himself and being able to have really good songs. I'm like, all right, I gave him a shot. He's actually pretty good. Did you listen to I don't Yummy? Agree with some of the stuff. Yeah, I did. It was good. Dude, that um, track is think, fire, boy. I just don't agree with the stuff he does outside of these music sometimes. Yeah, but that's he's, the whole thing. he's a controversial character, right? Especially because he has ties to, you know, Christian churches and stuff. And, and you kind of see this the star and you see his behavior and the fads that kind of go with it. So I understand it. It's strange. I think it's, there's something I can, I can't tell you what it is, but I, I don't know. You know, I, I get what you're saying. I understand that it's because there's something uncertain about what's going on. Is that, is that's kind of why I think I, maybe that's why I'm understanding what you're saying. Yeah. You know, um, kind of going back to what we're talking about. Do you remember um, what your like first experience was actually playing the music, like your guitar? Yeah, um, I, I remember my first experience. Uh, I grew up in church, so I always wanted to. See, I always, I seen a lot of people play guitar up on stage, and for me, as a kid, I wanted the limelight. I seen that as an opportunity to shine in front of people, and I'm not lying. This is the god honest truth. And it's sad. I, I don't want to say it. it's not sad, but me as an individual, I love performing. And I think that's just a part of the theatrical madness in my mind because I've always done that as a kid. And I barely realizing that now and really admitting to it now. Does that make sense? Yeah, I see it. So that was for me. That's kind of how I first sort of wanted to play guitar. Cause I seen that and that was in front of me. My mom, she sang in the church and she had a three part harmony. That was her group. Um, and man, they were bad. I mean, they would take some of the standards, the classic standards and they would roll them with a hard, like just, just hard beat. Uh, the, the piano player at their church, um, had more of like a R&B feel to his like you know his playing and the drummer learned how to play on the spot and they had a three part harmony and so I seen that every Sunday I see my mom play you know she, they would sing the standards and the standards are classic you know the classic songs that whatever the church whatever they had for that son, that that was years you know whatever it may mm -hmm. have been um and it was it was it was awesome to see my mom do that and so I wanted to do that too and that's kind of what was inspiring for me. But it didn't happen until it's about, like I said, I was about eight or nine when my uncle gave me that guitar. And that's when I was like, I put two and two together. Those people play guitar. If I learn how to play guitar, I can do that too. And um, that kind of sent me down the trajectory where I tried to mimic. I would see where they'd put their fingers on the fretboard. I'd come home and I would try to mimic that. And I would make terrible sounds because the guitar wasn't tuned. I didn't know how to tune the guitar at that. So I was flying blind from nine to 12. I was flying blind yeah. trying to start self guitar. Um, but yeah, that's how kind of how it started for me. Dude, mine was a lot mine was different. Um it was like I said, it was the end of summer, right? It was the month before school started. Yeah. I was at a friend's house and he just got a guitar. It was like one of these like really cheap fenders. It was like a first act guitar, I think. Esquire. Um yeah, no, it was an Esquire. It was like the Target, Walmart. I would have loved Esquire. 
Man, I would have loved a Squire. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It, it, this thing was so light. It was basically plywood. And, like, if a gust of wind came through his room, that guitar flew, dude. Like, wow. tight. It was crazy. But I remember him playing it. And I was like, what is that? Because, like, I've seen my dad. So I was like, I don't know what that is, really. And yeah. so I started playing it. And he goes, here, play it. I'm like, all right, I'm going to start playing this. And because he started playing just basic, like, one note things. I was like, in my mind, I was like, that's the most amazing thing I've ever seen. You know, this dude is a genius. <laughs> and I was like, I want to learn how to do that. And so he hands me the guitar and I start hitting it. All I hear is think, think, think. I was like, yo, how come mine isn't like making guitar sounds like yours? Is it not like, like me? Am I doing this wrong? What's wrong with this thing? <laughs> he goes, no, you have to push down on the frets, man. Oh my God. I was like, what's a, what's what's a, a fret? fret? <laughs> He's like those little, you see those little bars? You just gotta be in between them, man. And this is like someone who doesn't really know anything, just enough to know what a chord is. So he's just like trying to explain it and he pushes it down and I hit it and I'm like, oh, and I pushed down. Dude, I remember I played that guitar the whole night, the whole day. Wow. And like my fingers were hurting so bad because yeah. I was pushing down so much. It wasn't even like, you know, now when you play for a while, you know how much pressure you need to add. Yeah. You don't need to push in all the way. My hand was like bent all crazy from doing it because like, you don't know for the first time. You don't know, man. It was, and and it, it, was, was electric. it was crazy. Yeah, it was an electric wow. uh, first act. It, it looked just like a, a Telecaster. Not it was a, probably a, a old, old rusty strings, huh? No, dude. It was just these. It, dude, it felt like they just took like a brick. Oh, gosh. And like made it so thin to where it's like a string. It was the most gross feeling thing I've ever felt. Yeah. But it was the most awesome feeling also just like figuring out where all this stuff guitar was. Guitar player. And like, guitar players want to know that First song I learned was actually the, the Super Mario theme song. The first song I ever learned was Super Mario. I skipped so many steps. I didn't do the smoke in the water stuff or anything. But it wasn't like, do 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 It was like, do 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 It was like really, really. <laughs> like, you know the first yeah. song I learned how to play was? What, what was that? La Bamba. Oh God! Yep. And I just kind of, uh, I just picked it out. I learned it. I learned it by ear and by watching my uncle play it one time. And then after that, so your first guitar was that acoustic guitar. Right? It was an acoustic guitar. It was an acoustic old classical, um, just Spanish acoustic guitar, nylon string that my uncle gave me. And um, I watched him play La Bamba one time. And uh, then after that. That wasn't, he gave me the guitar and like maybe like a year or two later is when he showed me how to play La Bamba, uh, just casually, you know, just, we just, just in passing, he was the only person that gave me guitar information because he's the only person that, that I knew that played guitar, you know? And, um, but it was, there were just guitars around my aunt and uncle's house all the time. My cousin was just fluent in like every instrument, proficient in bass, guitar, you know, drums, guy's amazing. So, yeah. you know, I was always envious of him because he's just so good. And I hated the fact that he could jump on any instrument and just jam right away. Right. And I was like, oh, my God, I'm trying to figure out how to play this guitar still, you know. Um, but, yeah, some people, got it. some people got it like that. And I uh, some people work harder. Yeah. And I, I remember when I got the uh, the key, the first key uh, that I had to put my finger in certain positions was because my uncle showed me how to play La Bamba real quick. Um you know, he just picked up the guitar and just like showed me the chords real fast. And I just looked at his fingers, like putting the fingering position. That's, that's all it took for me to make that, that connection. That's how the, that's how I'm supposed to create the chords. And now I have to, now I have to figure out where the, my fingers and what position they go. I know they belong on the fretboard. How do I do that? And I memorized the first two positions. And then after that, I just was just trial and error to find the rest of the song. And that was it. That's how I learned how to play my first song. Yeah, that's how it's kind of for me. And um, then I figured out tablature when I found the internet. Um, when the internet came in, yeah. When the internet came into play. Because this is before the internet, ladies and gentlemen. Let me put this out into the into the, the, the ethos, whatever you want to call it out there, the atmosphere, the world, the interwebs. There was no internet for, you know, average people like me back in the day boomers when i was a kid you know 
the 90s it was very few and far between between uh, yeah. that you'd have a chance to even get on the internet and for me it was remember, at my public library yeah i remember it was like in high school is when the internet was like starting to become a thing and people started to use websites and then there was a uh, mx tabs MX that was like yeah. the main website <laughs> we yeah. would go i remember i'd go to the library and, and just turn out sheets all day I got and in for it. unfortunately we are innocent bystanders of a industry that has destroyed the internet called pornography because at that time too when you're a 13 year old boy <laughs> trying to find guitar tablature <laughs> there is no restrictions and you're not are you 18 can you believe they asked these questions on adult I entertainment guess. websites? Are you 18? Click. Can you believe that? That is trash. Like, what is the like, reasoning no, behind that? Oh, my gosh. For legal reasons to make sure yeah. you don't get to. Well, like, it says uh, it, he lied, obviously. We asked if he was 18. He said, yeah. Yeah. You know, yeah, it's, a lot of the internet. It out. Exactly. And the internet is such a, was such a trash place for you at 13 years old to discover, 14 years old to discover the wild, <laughs> the wild world web. And, um, yeah, but oh, you, you remember loading images that oh thing gosh. took forever. I don't want, I'm going to, if I, if I stay on this track, I'm going to confess some things that I do not want to confess. Yeah, let's just get back. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's, roll, let's reel it back. Uh, let's bring it back. We'll talk about internet and our experience with that growing up another day. Let's just reel it back. Okay. We'll get back to the music. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, Cause a lot of people don't, um, know what that's like. One day the internet's there and then it's like this whole crazy thing. Oh yeah. Downloading music too. You know, oh my people, goodness. Like my little brother is going to grow up with a generation with all these crazy stuff. It's like, dude, that wasn't available for us. Was it? You know, it's like, so you're, you uh, what was it? Uh, is it, uh, uh, Fantasia records that downtown? Yeah. 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 Los I used to go there a lot too. Oh man, that place. It smelled, this is a Fantasia records was a, is a record store, was a record store downtown Los Banos. I don't know. I don't think they're still there. I don't think they're there anymore. No, no, no. They've, they've been gone for a long yeah, time. Yeah. Okay. So the, I, I don't remember the, I don't remember the, the gentleman's name that owned the business, but this is somebody who would just smoke in the record shop. You know what I'm saying? And this is a tiny, like tiny day. little hole in the wall record store in Los Banos. So you imagine going there 15 years old looking for the the latest record and he has like maybe like maybe three little like um <clears throat> three little shelves that has you know your options because that's all you had because the internet yep. was not really a thing but shout out to fantasia records for being there that's a memory that will always be dear near and dear to my heart the skate park in los banos as well that's another one too Jeez, i'm sure yep. a lot of people share these memories from los banos so um anyways but yeah um moving on um speaking of the internet and like broadening our horizons for music uh what artist or like what album really inspired you to continue mastering like your instrument um because for me Jimi hendrix was my all-time inspiration and i'll you mm -hmm. know uh who would you what what you know can you give me some some feedback on that <clears throat> So, yeah, like I was saying before, like how it was kind of put into this little place where all you can listen to is metal. And so my music journey at that point was very not good, right? All I knew was drop the songs that had bar, code, bar chords and stuff yeah. like that. That was that's all I knew. Um, it wasn't until about halfway through junior uh, high school, I was like a sophomore. Um when a friend of mine introduced me to a band called thrice which is like an orange county band and at the time they were like post hardcore yeah. right <clears throat> but they had a lot of melodies and mel it was very melodic and i that kind of opened my eyes to this whole different genre that turned into like this emo music right yeah kind of led me down that rabbit hole but thrice was like the most pinnacle like moment for me when that opened me up to all these different types of music. Specifically right. one album that completely like blew the doors open, right? Which is um, their their fourth album. No. Yeah, their fourth album, Bisu, right? I remember when I first heard Bisu, it, during that time, I was still, still into metal still, right? I was kind of like 
moonlighting as a post hardcore kid, but like main job was being a metalhead, right? It was when I heard Visa for the first time, I was like, this album sucks. It's not heavy because Artist Ambulance was pretty heavy too. I was like, this album's not heavy. It wasn't until I heard the last song, the last song, which is called Red Sky, that completely just like opened the door for me for everything. Wow. Because that song made me completely re listen to the album in a different, different light. Because it was just such a, it was such a different song from the rest of the album, right? And, and so, and the, the thing about, the thing about Thrice, I think maybe, I don't know if this is kind of like where you're, uh, if this comes into play or not, is that their balance between heavy and like melody, like thick, chuggy riff, like, like rhythms and also very like melody, very watery, very free, um, sort of melodies as well i think they have a really good balance of that and that too is kind of like when we were growing up that's soft like you were soft if you listened to that you know yeah if you listen to that oh you're soft you're not hard you know there's not a hundred percent screams you know it's like i mean and then there were sometimes there'd be like your bro would be like yo i love that band but i'm never gonna play it in the car you know that kind of stuff too <laughs> yeah the only people that would like thrice from my other friend group was like people who like to awake avenge the dead that was like the only song they liked because it was hella heavy yeah <laughs> but no that the red sky song really like opened me up it helped me because i started reaching out to people it's like how is he doing this with his voice at the end and that's when i learned how to like falsetto sing and like it taught me a lot it taught me a lot how to play my guitar because i wanted to learn that song so bad yeah and at the time i was just really doing um just basically bar court like bar courts the whole time yeah even though like uh, it was it was just it kind of made me really lazy with the guitar and then when i heard that song it kind of woke me back up especially thrice in general when i first heard thrice it woke me up and i started learning how to play faster and how to play like they do yeah but that song really just like made me love reverb especially reverb and delay that song introduced me to that world Oh my you gosh, know. a pedal, geez, changes the whole game. Yeah, because all, <clears throat> all I had was a metal zone. Oh <laughs> I had a crappy metal zone, which I didn't even use. I, I, I modded it to just be a, a basically a boost. A metal zone is the, a guitar pedal um, effect, and it's just it's just straight up distortion. And it's just nothing but high gain all day. Yeah. I, I used it as a boost to boost the overdrive on my amp. And then I eventually swapped that out for like a super overdrive, a boss super overdrive. But like, I, I, for me, Jimi Hendrix kind of was the inspiration for me. And I remember, so growing up, I grew up in a, a very conservative household. And so we didn't listen to a lot of non Christian music, only except for yeah. oldies and, you know, some classic rock, whatever was appropriate, whatever my mom deemed appropriate. <clears throat> And, uh, you know, I, I love my mom to death. She's just doing her best to, to raise us as children, right? She didn't know any better. She's just doing her best. Um, and, you know, so there was a lot of music that I was sheltered from. And I remember one time there was this Christian artist named, uh, geez, I'm trying to remember his name. <sighs> Gosh, I can't remember his name. Anyways, I had, I had his tape and he was like my favorite artist at the time. And I was about nine years old at the time. And my mom was like, yo, like the church kind of uh, had word in the church that the this artist was promoting, like, you know, something that wasn't that wasn't it was counter to what we believed. And so she made me break my tape with a hammer. She made me smash my tape and I cried and I smashed that tape. Um, his name was Carmen. That was the name of the artist. His name was Carmen. And uh, mm. so I cried because I was my favorite artist when I was a kid and I and and I smashed his tape. But then shortly after I stole the tape. I stole a tape that had Woodstock on it. And that's where I saw uh Santana. And that's where I saw Jimi Hendrix and I saw all this it was just a documentary. And I stole yeah. it from my once again my aunt and uncle's house. Jesus, man, they're hearing everything. I'm so sorry. I stole a VHS tape. <laughs> um and I kept I kept it hidden for years, and I just loved I I I you know just had it, um, and that was like my secret obsession was that the music that I heard. And if you go back and you listen, you go back and you like listen to music in that time. You listen to the guitar. You listen to the just the tone, the cl like the classic rock tone. You listen to 
you know, Santana when he plays Soul Sacrifice. I think that's it is. Is that the track? Um, and you just hear that Afro Bohemian sort of like, you know, rhythm in the background and this just amazing guitar shredding on the top of it. And then you have someone like you know, Jimi Hendrix, who's just this all-star raw, just power and fuzzed out, just buttery riffs that are so, to me, it was so inspiring. And so that attracted me and I wanted to do that. I didn't want to be the church guitar player. I wanted to be a rock star. And some of my first accounts as a child writing, writing, what do you want to be when you grow up is I want to be famous. That seriously, that was my answer, because in my head, that's what I want to be. I want to be. It was just a rock star when I grow up, and um, unfortunately, there's not a lot of avenues uh, to become a rock star in real life. So I decided I was just gonna play guitar and be a mediocre guitar player. So yeah, yeah, I agree to that. <laughs> <laughs> but anyways, that's how that's how I kind of got interested in playing guitar. That's what drove me to play guitar to the next step because I started learning all a bunch of classic rocks, rock songs. I you know I bought Beatles books. Um, I bought uh, Incubus. My friend, my next door neighbor, introduced me into Incubus, and I really got into you know some more different alternative styles and. Um, you know, funk stuff like that, like the Red Hot Chili Peppers and stuff like that by the time I was in junior high, high school. Um, but by the time I came to high school, if you weren't, you know, post hardcore or beyond that, like you didn't know what music was. And if you weren't full on, you know, um, top 100 hip hop artists, you know, of the day, like you didn't know what good music was. That was the culture of our high school at the time. Or if, or then there was a really big group of people that really like sad country songs during that time, which I didn't understand. I'm like, you're a teenager. You know, how, how much can you relate to a guy in his truck? You're a teenager. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So <clears throat> that was another huge thing. So if you liked anything outside of that, those little bubbles, it was kind of, uh, it was kind of weird. You know, you just wasn't heard of. And it, it, it all, so here's what I mean by bubble is like, um, like K-pop. If you like something that w was, you know, that was a, a genre of music that wasn't from the United States, wasn't American popular music, that wasn't cool, you know. Yeah. K-pop was not wasn't a thing, you know. If you liked Mexican music and you were Mexican, you weren't allowed to listen to your Mexican music. You were made fun of. You were told turn that you know slur word music yeah. off. Because we don't, it's not American popular music. That's what I'm, that's what we're talking about right now. That's what we're getting back to when it says like, when we were talking about like these, the bubbles of music culture when we were growing up and in, it wasn't until I was in my early twenties, 23, 24, that I started appreciating clean, simple chords, music for just the simplicity of it. And, um, and John Mayer taught me that lesson because one of John Mayer's videos, famous videos, I forget, I forget who he's talking to. He says, uh, one of the things that he was taught was that you don't want to just be an artist to make music, but you want to be listenable, yeah. you know? So it doesn't mean you need to be heard, but it needs, you need to be listenable because there's a difference. Being heard means that you are forcibly you know, making a noise for somebody to hear and to listen means that somebody chooses to actually participate in the, you know, audio that you're producing. So, you know, there's a difference there. And that's one thing that he had said. He said, I want to be listenable. And that changed the game for me because I started playing for my church because I, I decided that I was going to, um, just follow in my parents' faith, you know, and, and, and I just not saying that in that I'm following after them, but, um, you know, I came to realize myself that this is what I want to do in my life. This is the, this is the lifestyle that I want to pursue for myself. And I, you know, and I, and I enjoy it. And so I started participating and playing with my church, playing guitar for my church and in for Christian modern worship music, it's very ambient, very, you know, delayed, very, uh, um, spacey. And, um, that kind of stuff was fun. 
it was, it was it's it's fun to do it's relaxed guitar playing there's not a lot of pressure on you you just get to enjoy the simplicity of the music and the melodies that a lot of these artists create i think are beautiful <clears throat> Where if you had, if I would have admitted that when I was 15 years old around my friends, it'd be like, you're whack. Don't talk to me. They wouldn't have taken my perspective on music seriously. <clears throat> so that's how I'm, I mean, I appreciate the discussion because, you know, I, I, I hope people can appreciate music for what it physically is um, as well, because that's the same thing for me with rap. A lot of rap music I don't care to listen to. Okay, but I there is some there is there is a there is hip hop that I I think I would die on the hill and say is the best because I'm I mean it's very we're all opinionated about it but uh you know but I but it needs to exist like country a lot of people nowadays country is taking uh it's starting to take a back seat you know it's not as popular as it was twenty years ago country music today. Um, the very mention of country music. Sometimes people just be like, you're whack. I can't believe you like country music, but man, I'm a sucker for a good country love song. You know what I'm saying? Like the guitars, the tones and classic country rock and country, like just those melodies, those love ballads, Garth Brooks, shout out to the, uh, the Wiley brothers. Uh, we used to hang out around Starbucks listening to Garth Brooks. Because they were down with country. Shout out to you guys. But, um, yeah. Anyways. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm not, I'm still not at that phase where I understand country properly. Like, there's a, there's that one song I liked <laughs> that was a country song. I can't remember the band. You liked Old Town Road, huh? No. Well, I mean, yeah, it's, that's a banger too. But, like, <laughs> uh, it was a different song. It was like, I remember I showed it to you. You told me the band. I just can't remember it. I'd have to pull it up, but yeah, I, I I don't know. I can appreciate country, but I also feel like country music is very closed off in general to people. Yeah, there you is know? a very there is a lot of artists the way they write their songs excludes a lot of people. But that, but now but you have artists like Darius Rucker, who's you know I think is make making a lot of progress in in that in that audience, you know. Uh, yep. being a uh, you know a man of color in that industry is important um, same thing like with um, <clears throat> gosh well, with what's his name who did Old Town Road you know that's a very very important you know that, mm -hmm. that these people have been represented in that genre of music right um, so yeah anyways <clears throat> I think that's good. I think that's good news for country music because I'm a sucker for country music. Like I said, I love me some country music. My wife knows it. She hates it, but she knows it. <laughs> I don't hate it. I just, I don't know. Like sometimes it feels like they're just phoning it in. Like it doesn't sound. Creative. Oh yeah, no, for sure. Oh dude, the same thing like, with Christian, the same thing with Christian music. If you listen to any modern Christian worship music, you, there are very specific plugs and certain specific formulas as to how to write their songs. And it's very, very commercial. And you can find that you find that in very, in a lot of industries and come on, country music is so commercial. Every, every industry can have commercial, you know, commercialism in it. Right. Yeah, you know, country music was created by the car companies to sell trucks. There you go. That's the truth. Boys, look it up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and a lot of artists are just producing music for the sake of, you know, producing music. And, you know, there's a lot of that you got to filter through, too. But then again, art subjective, so I don't really know. I don't want to get... I can't really get into that either, so... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Anyways, uh, how did you evolve through your journey? I think that's kind of like the overarching sort of like theme that we're trying to get through with with music today. It's kind of like how it kind of led us through our journey in music. I'm kind of talking about how we came up playing this sort of genre of music, a lot of rock and roll, or just rock. I'm not gonna call it rock and rock and roll. Rock. Yeah, we can't it's call rock. it rock and roll. It's just rock music, right? It's a genre of rock. It's a subgenre. Okay. Um, and the community that we grew up in, uh, this was sort of kind of like just what we did. There was a lot of kids had bands around that time. You know, we were growing up. Everybody had a band. We all wanted. Everyone was a band. Or and they this, were a cover band. They were a cover uh, band. 
and well, Blink One, yeah, Blink One Eighty Two was like the beginning of it. Well, that's when it, I have to shout out a few people uh, because Blink One Eighty Two, Blink One Eighty Two was one of those bands that it, you started off liking them, and then four years later you hated them. You know what I'm saying? Mm, I just lost interest. I didn't hate them. Then they came back, and then I lose interest. Yeah, then now they back. came back. Well, no, I'm saying like the genre between, you know, punk, you know, and like metal music you you may have gotten introduced the thread you may have been like introduced to blink 182 which all of a sudden somehow connected you and led you in a direction to get towards you know like um slipknot right mm. and by the time you get on the deep end of slipknot people are like oh, like oh we forgot about blink 182 all of a sudden you know and uh it just you know just because it was it wasn't as hard you know what i'm saying yeah but okay anyway so <clears throat> yeah during this time this is like during the time of guitar hero as well so a full-on commercial retail stuff is going on like you're seeing people wanting like your kid is asking for a four thousand dollar guitar for christmas because we're playing video <laughs> yeah. games looking at these cool guitars and we're like i want this mama and, i want a yeah. gibson Les Paul custom white with gold knobs and hardware please with all of it yeah give it to i want all of it i only want the best (laughs) yeah and um yeah so like i remember just being in high school wanting to get better equipment but knowing my parents would never buy it for me because it was it's expensive and vanity that's all it was it was just pure vanity it was no i wasn't a good enough guitar player still not a good enough guitar player for the stuff that i want Uh, Mm -hmm. but it was just pure vanity. It's just, I want it because it's beautiful. It, it probably sounds better because it's more expensive, you know, and I'll get in, we'll get into guitars and prices eventually one day because there's a whole entire, you know, system for that. Uh, but that's what it was. And you, you know, I've seen other kids get really good gear and I was like super jealous growing up all the time, but you know, you just sort of kind of, a lot of us didn't have the good gear. A lot of us had, you know, just crap, but we wanted to play and we started bands with it anyways. And we played in the dirt. You know, we played in the rain. We played in parking lots. You name it. We were there. (laughs) Played in the cuts. Yeah. We were, we were in the trenches, dude. It was hardcore. What was your first band that you ever played in? God, I can't even remember. I remember my first show, but not my first band. Because there was like, I think at the time when you first started off playing any, any like musical instrument, you just join band. Yeah, that's true. No matter what band it is. You just, like, I remember I was in a band with like the same two people just rotating a million times before I ended up like, this isn't going to work. And then I've joined another band by myself. Yeah. That's like but me. So like, I just remember like those practices. Every first practice is like really awkward, because it's like no one knows what everyone's level is at comprehending the music or being able to understand what you're telling them. Yeah, because uh, you don't, you, you don't. Jeez, you know? tell me about it. It was rough <clears throat> sometimes where I'm kind of like tell them like I because I was kind of quiet, right? I wasn't. I don't really talk that often. I've grown up since then, but at that time I was kind of quiet and like i didn't really say anything but it was like when i had to tell them something's like you guys obviously don't know what you're talking about about any of this music stuff you guys talk in chugs and that's it and numbers numbers don't help me it was rough especially when you at the time you kind of knew what notes were <laughs> and they're just like yeah, yeah. dude it's it's a, it's a one five six seven and you're on like, the don't don't the even go there string. with me dude don't like, even what the hell does that mean you got to give me the, references, yeah. You can't just give me the numbers and expect me to figure out how I'm supposed to yeah, play these. Exactly. Like, yeah. Or they'll come up if, to the fret and they'll go in. They'll like they point at the fret, what you, how you're supposed to play it. I'm like, what? What is this? Yeah, that's so difficult, and because you're looking at it in mirror image, and you're like, oh my gosh, trying to translate in your head. I hated that. So my <laughs> thing was, I hated showing up. 
I hated showing up and like you said, not knowing the skill level of the other musicians there, right? Because if you were underskilled, if you didn't have enough skills to play with them, you f- you definitely dropped the ball. You know what I'm saying? That's what it felt like. You dropped the ball. Like, I'm not good enough, you know what I'm saying, to play, dang, I'm the weak link in the chain, right? You're holding yeah. back the band. But then if you were the more skilled player and you're on the other end of it and you have to teach somebody, you're like, oh my God, this is going to take hours and more effort. And it's hard to get a square inch when you're barely learning your instrument. You know what I'm saying? The little gains that you have, you're like, you want to hold on to. And to regurgitate them is a whole nother story. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It was strange. Yeah. It, it was it was very bad, but then when I finally joined the band, I kind of understood music. Yeah, it wasn't until like it wasn't until like later on. But I remember it wasn't like, until like, I found when I found my when I found when I started my own band is when I when I found the right skill level of players that I could manage. Yeah. It wasn't until then um, because before then I'd played with people. I was a drummer for a band one time. My friend Ferguson's band. Uh, we just did like a one time project, um, and. Uh, that was, we were called Etch and we did like nine songs in the middle of, 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 of Pacheco Park or something like that. I can't remember. And um, I played drums for them. Um, and honestly, it was a fun experience to play with people, but not playing the instrument that you love to play and having to play a, a, an instrument that you know how to play, but you don't necessarily enjoy is a terrible position to be in. And cause that's what I did for the the six months that we practiced and and the thing was that my skills as a drummer weren't developed because i i was a spare drummer i was backup drummer you know what i'm saying that's the, that's the position yeah. that i was i was i could play guitar and i could sing and i'm a backup drummer is the that's what i would do when i'd go audition at other bands you know i'd go find other good garage bands and you'd show up with your gear and be like i could sing i could play guitar and if i really need me to in a pinch i can hold down a drum beat right that's what you would do. Um, but in this project, um, I really didn't, I, we were just having fun and I sort of just spoke up and was like, I just want to participate. You know what I'm saying? I just want to participate. And, um, I regret that decision <laughs> cause I wish I would have played guitar. Um, no, I don't regret it, but you know, it's, it's just, it's, it was a fun, it was a fun experience. I got to do a, a solo song at the end, um, which was fun. I dedicated that to, um, to my grandmother who had passed away. So that was very mm-hmm. memorable. I remember that performance and that's what I lived for to do that performance, you know? Uh, but I, I mean, it was fun. I didn't, I'll never regret the friendships that I made out of that. Uh, it was, I met some of, uh, some of my best friends growing up with, you know, I mean, we're still good friends now, but you know, catch up with them on Facebook and stuff. <clears throat> mm-hmm. But I'm sure they would remember, all agree that, that remember after your it show? was torture. They would all agree it was torture by the time it was done. We were all like, oh, God. <laughs> Do you remember uh, your first show? Yeah, the first show I ever played was with Nick Stockdale. We played at Hot Dog Heaven with my brother. And we played three <laughs> songs. We played uh, two covers and a half of an original. And that's when we officially decided to be a band. A band. Yeah. Yeah, dude. That, to me... Hot dog. That's now what I mean. That's my that's my first show. That's the first official band that I was actually in because I auditioned for several other bands and didn't make the cut, or I didn't want to be in their bands because of the direction they were going musically. And and I'm I'm talking about this and like this is like you're a kid and you're like nah I don't like your style. You're whack. You don't wear <laughs> dickies. You're not cool. You know what I'm saying like. Oh God. This was like, this was the mentality. This, this is not like no big bucks deal. This is just neighborhood talk and you're just talking trash to your friend who has a squire and you're like, yeah, well, guess what? I got a, I got a, I got a, a Fender Mim, which is made in Mexico, you know, which is like a step higher than just, you know, a trashy squire, right? But it's still an amazing yeah. guitar, right? Um, and you, if you had that, you'd be jealous. You'd be like, oh my God, I wish I had that. Um, anyways. I remember, I remember my first show, it was. Dude, my first show was crazy, right? What? Did, uh, is this we, where the I, cop thing happened? No, that was oh, a while ago. Okay, I'll, okay, I'll okay, tell yeah, that story yeah, too. Yeah, yeah. But no, um, the first show I ever played was in a garage, right? So I joined this band with uh, these three friends I met in St. Louis, right? Which is a, a secondary yeah. high school. And we dream, He made it. We made a band, and we only practiced for like maybe a week or two. <laughs> and we, he's like, let's throw a show. 
you know, we're good enough. It's like, dude, we don't, I don't even know how to play these songs yet. Yeah. Dude, none of us do the songs. <laughs> we're just like, screw it. We're going to play as loud as we can and as heavy as <laughs> hey, we that's can. That's how you go, dude. And, dude. That first show was rough. And I remember, <clears throat> like, he he knew so many people and they came out. There was maybe like 20, 30 people there, like in front of his garage. I, and I'm just like, oh, <laughs> God. And so Jeez. that was my first show. We're playing against like 20, 20, 30 people was my first show. And then like, I don't yeah. know these songs. They don't know the songs. We're just playing it. The singer is just grunting the whole time. I, <laughs> it was so I, bad, man. What, what, like what, what part of Los Banos was that in? What neighborhood? Um, Come on, shout out. Shout out to the hoods. Like, it's probably uh, where the... If you're going down Mercy Springs towards like, you know, all the way down to where that church is, you know, Mercy Springs. Uh, yeah, the Church of the yeah, Nazarene. So if you're, if you're, yeah, if you're going straight down that way, yeah, there now there's a Circle K, and there's homes behind the Circle right. K, okay. like a road. Yeah. I used to work That's at the Circle where K. It was. Okay, yeah, I yeah. know what you're talking about. Okay, but like that was before not... the Circle K was there, it was all dirt. <clears throat> yeah, yeah, you yeah, know, I remember what you're talking about. That's where that first show was, and there's hella people, and they're like, that was so sick. I'm like, these people are either stoned or being really friendly or a little bit of both. That was there that was trash. How old were you? Really bad. How old were you when this happened? I was like 17, maybe 16. Yeah, that was me. That was me too. As I I had my long hair. I was so it was definitely like 16 or 17. And it, it was real bad. And I remember I was, I, I didn't move. Like, how you know how I, when we would play shows together, I, like, was moving around a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But at that show, I all I did was have my hair down and just kind of did the, the you know, in South Park where they do the emo kids headbang? Yeah. With the dance? Yeah. That's what I did. Nice. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was bad, dude. It was really bad. Yeah, I played at, I played with, I played at Hot Dog Heaven with Nick Stockdale my brother and we played two shows. covers we played two i remember we played uh everlong by the foo fighters and another song i can't remember which one we played oh man i'm trying to think it had to have been an easy one i think it was huba stank or something reason the reason mm-hmm. is done i don't know i don't think i was there for that. i might have been i, I think it, it, might it have may have been it. those two songs and then we had written the chorus to our first song and we just kind of played it for people. We're like, we just want to play this because we wrote it and we think it's cool. And we played it. And then our friends were just kind of, there was like, must be like 12 or 13 people there. It was, there was nobody there that was, you know, really paying attention to us. But, um, you know, our friends were just really encouraged us. And then we decided to be a band. And that's when me and Nick and Luke started our first band, Velcro by Design. And that was cool because me and Nick ended up in guitar class together. Um, we were already in guitar class together and that's how we had met. That's how we started playing together. And this is what I talk about skill level is that, uh, Nick was already at a skill that was, you know, appropriate for me to play along with, like we could actually play together and that was mm-hmm. hard to find. It was very hard to find that at that time, you know, and we were, he was a freshman. And I was a senior in high school and because everything that I'd learned was all self-taught. And when I was a senior in high school, they offered, <clears throat> oh wait, there was, there was, I took guitar as a freshman. That's right. I took it as a freshman, but me, I was in, fr- I was in guitar class with my first band with Carolina Nava and Ferguson, Ferguson, Sobe Rogan. I was in, I was in guitar class with them as a freshman and we knew to, we know how to play guitar, um, better than the introduction, you know, chorus was going to teach you. So they would lock us in a closet. They wouldn't lock us in there. They just put us in a closet. Okay. And we would have to, we have to play the guitar with the lights off. So they would put us in the closet and they'd like, turn the lights off and now play the songs because <laughs> they would add difficulty. Right. And you had to learn muscle memory. You had to actually learn to play your instrument. And this is, this is so funny. We had a great guitar instructor. Um, but the introduction class only taught you, you know, basic chords, it just taught you, um, you know, how to, how to play like a simple rhythm for like painted black and like the lead for painted black, right. To get you, uh, to get you to be a proficient guitar player to play, you know, simple covers. Right. And so already at that point, Ferguson, Carolina, myself, we had already, no, so no. And Cynthia, Cynthia Biebs, I think. Yeah, we were already proficient in guitar. We already could play and sing together. And so we were like, what do we do? 
you know so they're just like go in the go over there and practice in the closet so we would just practice and that's how we started our first band because we kind of met in guitar class together i i was a backup drummer for everybody you know i just kind of had a kit grow my brother had a guitar uh, my brother had a drum kit right and because he had it he was a drummer. I just always around the drum kit. I kind of naturally picked up a few little things, little tricks. And so I could fill in for drums. Right. And that's how I met my, my first actual, um, performance with a band, but it wasn't the first like actual, like, like show for a band. Right. That we just got together to play one performance, you know, that was it to showcase to like our family and friends that we were playing our instruments, you know, which was really fun. (laughs) But then, uh, but my first real band was, was like I said, first real show was with Nick, my brother. Yeah, dude, when we hit those Hot Dog Heaven shows, I think that was maybe like, like 20, 30, like 20 seconds sh- time playing in front of audience already, dude. I was a vet. Yeah. I was a vet then when those Hot Dog Heaven shows kicked off. Oh, yeah. Oh, I mean, me too. At that point, I'd, I'd played I played for youth groups and stuff like that in front of like a little, like we'd have like this thing called First Priority and stuff. And I'd volunteer to play a song every other you know whenever i had a chance and stuff so it was, i mean it was i was definitely involved in performing arts in front of people and i would take every opportunity to do that um because that's just what i like to do i was involved in like plays and stuff growing up all the time any opportunity i can get involved in you know music and plays stuff like that i was photography, videography, any of those things I can get my hands on because it was something that I just naturally wanted to do. <laughs> um, oh, yeah. you. So you mentioned the, the cop story. Yes, the cop story, dude. This story the is cop funny. story. Okay, so um, the context is uh, we were – the high school for Los Banos, where we're from, decided to hold a – Battle of the Bands, I think, or it was just a concert. I don't remember what is, it was. This is like 2000, what, three, 2004? It was a long time ago. 2005-ish, um, maybe? Because, like, I wasn't in the band that I was with when we met you, right? So this is yeah. a different band. This is a completely different and band. So we were playing, and I just bought, like, a wireless system, right? I just bought a wireless system, and I was like, heck yeah. And I was learning how to do the most stupidest trick ever created on a guitar which is spin your guitar around your like neck basically right yeah. you just chuck yeah. it and it spins around it looks cool but it's the most stupidest thing ever and um i have my guitar completely taped up what kind from, of guitar like, the, is, was it it was a uh ibanez i don't remember what bought i gave geo? It, i traded ibanez nick, geo it was ibanez geo that's what it was it was the one i traded nick but oh um this is it, one it, it said two it, was it said two pickups and one humbucker in the bridge yeah so it, two, two, single pickups, two singles two singles and he had the humbucker in the bridge yeah ivan is um i had that thing like taped up right so like the, the my guitar strap was taped up to the body yeah. and the where it connects on the top yeah that thing was on there and so it got to a part where the show where i was gonna do it and I do it, and I don't know how it happened, because I don't know how, right? I, I, didn't, I still don't know how this happened. Yeah. I chuck it, because I practice a bunch, and it, it was going perfect. I chuck it, it, the duct tape snaps, and as it's going right behind me, it just snaps, and it takes off, dude. It takes off into the crowd. I don't know where it goes, right? I just see the direction it goes in. I'm like, oh crap. And I get off stage really quick to go find my guitar. Right. Yeah. And I'm running up and I see someone with it. And I'm like, oh, thank you, thank you. And I grab the guitar and he the guy's not letting go. Yeah. And I look up at the guy and he's a big dude. Cause remember, we were still like, we weren't like the six four beasts that we are today. <laughs> right. This is pre pu- this is during puberty. This is this is like this secondary is evolutionary we were, form, right? Because you're like, not max puberty. In, in you know, Pokemon, we were not max Pokemon, there's like the first, right? There's first level, there's, and there's like level we stage evolution. two. We were evolution two, dude. Stage we two. Three, yeah. Oh, that weird looking formation. Stage two is yeah, always dude. weird. You look at the evolution yeah, sure. of all Pokemon. Stage two is always kind of just jangly looking. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's a, I go and grab it. I look at the guy because he's not letting go. Yeah. And I look at him. I'm like, what are you doing? And I see that it's a cop, right? And this cop is holding on to it. 
and I'm just like trying to get it out of the cop's hand. Yeah. Because they, um, he said it hit me. I was like, oh, I'm sorry. It's not like I'm like I'm, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to hit you. It broke. And he's like not letting go. And then he like finally after I tug enough, of it, he lets go. And oh I run gosh. back on stage and then just like kind of knee it. Because the strap's broken. Oh my god! And so I'm meaning it. And then we finished the set, and someone brought a chair, and I finished the last song. And I remember, I don't want to say his name because he has a controversy now with him. Okay. But there was an English teacher, right? Yeah. He came up to me because we after we finished the set, we went backstage, right? Yeah. Where all the music stuff is. Okay. He comes and tells me like right a little bit after he says the cop is looking for you because you hit him with a guitar. And he says, he thinks you did it on purpose. And I'm just, I told the teacher, I was like, is he an idiot? How in the hell did I do this on purpose? The strap broke. And I don't think I have the precision to like. Yeah. And this was, this, this is live in front of an audience. Live in front of a studio in a full audience. Dark room. Yeah. I have blinding lights on me. The whole areas where the fans are, are pitch black. And I hit this cop in the corner. Like there is no way I could have done that. Right. And he's like, he's looking for you. And then the next day, he, the same teacher came up and told me, he was like, yeah, that cop um, had to go to the hospital for you hitting him. I was like, dude, first off, this dude had body armor. Right. Yeah. So I'm pretty sure he did not suffer any damage from a, a, I a think 10 I know, pound I, guitar. I think I know which English teacher you're talking about. Um, this is one who is involved in. Yeah. Well, we're not talking about it. Okay, but yeah. he's the one that, yeah. Yeah. Um, he, so I remember he told me that and I was laughing the whole way home I was telling the guys I was like yeah he told me that the cop is trying to find me but because I, I think I, I don't I don't think I was a student at the time I already graduated when that happened so like I wasn't a student so they couldn't just like pull me up and plus I didn't even go to this, that school yeah right I was transferred to San Luis so it's like they don't really have much on me. Wow. So the cop we went Later to the boys. hospital. It's like, see, you got away with hitting the trap. Loophole. Loophole in like, the it system. Was accident, it was right? an accident. It was an accident. It was clearly an accident. I was still, I was still a minor, so it yeah. wasn't like I was intentionally trying to... Sh- I didn't even know the cops were there. Yeah. Because they were all in the corners, right? Yeah. I, I didn't even know cops were there until I grabbed my guitar, and I was like, oh, crap, there's a cop here. I, I remember uh, one of my... How, how do you think this miner hit you with his guitar from like 20, 30 feet away, you know, in a pitch black room? Honestly, I'm kind of glad it hit him and not like someone else and like in the head or something. Yeah. Because then I would have been in way trouble. But it's like, dude, I like... That's why I, I stopped doing it after that day. 100%. <laughs> I was like, this move is the stupidest move. Never be a showman. It's moral of the story, never be a showman. When you think it's going to be cool, it's not going to be cool. I think every yeah, yeah, yeah. every musician has this story. They have this type of story. Like, you're going to go do something cool, and then, like, you just, you know, you messed it up you somehow, guitar, some you, way. You hit your singer in the face, yep. Yep. or it breaks and it takes off. Yeah. It, I hated that. But, you know, that's a, that's a, that's a lesson that went with me for, like, the whole, my whole time playing music is that. Don't spin your guitar around your neck. <laughs> yeah. And I, I, it's one of those things too, is like when you, we you start playing and you start like, you know, just wanting to participate in making music because you enjoy it and it's fun. And there's a, there's a point where uh, music is kind of like a, when you, it, it's a co- very communal thing when you do it together with other people and it becomes participatory. And that's like when it, be, for me, it becomes so engaging at that point. Because when I play, uh, I play guitar for my church <clears throat> and uh, I volunteer. And so um, usually we'll just play, you know, a couple songs every other, every other week and stuff. Um, but the part that I, I really enjoy about it the most is the fact that other people engage in it with you. And, and it's not necessarily about my, my playing. That's why I like playing for my church because it's not necessarily about my, my, my talent level. It's the fact that they know the song and that we d- to do it together and enjoy in the song together a little bit, um, which is to me, I, I love that, you know? Um, so, I mean, everybody's, I think kind of has a little different reason why they like music. But for me, there's just something about doing it with people. 
that I really enjoy, especially playing in, in bands, playing with my brother. I mean, I, my brother is the greatest drummer I've ever met in my life, and that's only because I'm not saying that because he's my brother. I, that's not I'm not saying that because he's my brother, but it's only because we played and we've written so much music together uh, that I would not, I don't want to play with any other drummers. Um, that's my preference. Obviously I know I will play with other drummers because I'm, you know, I want to participate in the music industry. So, <clears throat> but like, yeah, like I said, um, once again, like it's very more, very more for me, it's about doing it with people and having that. Cause that's how it started for me. I wanted to participate and create some sort of entertainment for people. Right. And I want people to react to it. I want to, I, that's what I want. That's what I've always wanted to want. And I was kind of always like this sort of, uh, let, put me in the front, you know, let me juggle, you know, let, let me do my, my little, you know, thing. Um, and there was a group of us that I know there's a group of people that I went to high school with that I know were like that. And, um, you just kind of have it in you. You just sort of, it's just something that you just want to do, you know? So it, it was funny because that, um, that op those opportunities that I had, like in in high school, to participate and do like you know the talent shows that we had, the um, guitar performances that we had, and stuff like that. All those things taught me something that I was able to use to that I still use today. You know, because I'm like I'm I'm record I record uh, guitar videos uh, of me and my wife singing and leading uh, you know worship songs for our church. And some of the practices that I learned then I'm still using today because they're still valuable in, in, in the craft and what we do, you know, and there's a little bit of that as a, as a, I think as a musician that you kind of want, you know, you, you want to, I don't, some people will say they don't do it for the entertainment. You know, they're like, I only do it for the music. I don't, I don't think that's true. I personally, I don't think it's true. I don't think there's an artist who's solely is just like, I do it for the music. No, there's a little bit of it of you in your music. And there's a little bit of you that wants to participate in providing something for other people. Right. Would you agree with yeah. that? Yeah. So, yeah. so, you know, I think that to me is like, that's why I appreciate all these experiences with music, playing with other people, like playing. Here's another one. My uncle, he plays a lot of Spanish music, a lot of Mexican music, you know, a lot of like, uh, I don't know. I think it's Tijano music is how you say it. Tijano music. Um, a lot of these sort of different and it's music from a different culture and the way they play their chords, the way they play their rhythms, their chord changes, all those things are different. And if I think about it today, a lot of those roots that we have in our folk music when it comes to uh mexican folk music mariachi music and stuff like that all of that stuff too is always tied into with other cultures too and it's very familiar if you listen to like uh if you listen to mariachi music and you also listen to like some opera music you know you can hear the passion in the voices the technique the sort of you know the appreciate the value of the styles and stuff like that you know um so those are things that I've learned from those different experience. I learned that from playing music with him. I learned about harmonizing from playing music with my sister and my mom. They love to sing together, you know, and that's something that I've always valued from them is being able to sing together in harmony. I've always been jealous of that because I'm not good at it. I try my wife's like, uh, maybe you shouldn't. I'm like, all right, I won't. <laughs> but I love when they do that stuff, you know thrice that type that you specifically you and chris introduced me to that band um i've never even heard of them before you guys came along started introducing that type of like um you know i think the very passionate singing from the the mariachi music the folk music you know uh that passion behind it implemented in the type of rhythm and heavy driven guitars like thrice to me putting that and collaborating that together would be amazing sound right that's kind of how mm. i i don't know i think now in my musical journey it's where i'm just kind of taking bits and pieces of things that i hear that i want to hear together now you know a little bit of this a little bit of that so like sometimes some sunday mornings for our church uh, our director our music director he'll be like hey if you feel like you want to do a little lead go for it take a lead on that spot and i'm like all right cool um and i'll you know i'll usually dial up something that sounds close to uh u2 because that's kind of most modern worship music sounds like u2 
go back and listen to Sunday Bloody Sunday by U2. It sounds like a modern Christian worship song. I guarantee you, U2, the band U2 with with Bono, yeah. Uh, The Edge, yes. Um, So if you go listen to, you listen to U2 and listen to modern Christian worship music, a lot of those tones and a lot of the guitar players today base their style of playing off of The Edge. Okay, (laughs) that's awesome, you know? You kind of get that influence in there a little bit. Um, so I like that a lot. I like what they're doing with that too. Um, yeah, man. Anyways. What, this- is, uh, what did you think? Cause um, it was crazy how our musical journeys like kind of went and then we kind of came to a point where me and you both started like a band together. Yeah. So remember I, I remember I played with my friend Nick and you played with your friend Chris and uh, mm-hmm. we played a lot of, this is when we were kids, high school, right after high school, like maybe I'd say between 15 to 21-ish is probably around that. 15 to 23 is probably around that time when I played with a lot of bands. I played with people from 15 to 23. And I'm not just saying, you know, like I played with my church band. I played with, you know, 60-year-old guitar player dudes that wanted to have a country swing band. I played with my friends who had a guitar band, you know, had a garage band. I played for my church. I played with whoever I could, performed wherever I could because it's what I like to do, you know. Um, I think the same thing with you, right? Yeah, pretty yeah. much. So, um, but then, so all that, those, that kind of time just kind of led us towards where... I stopped playing for probably about five years. Same. I would say I'd say my mid twenties, I stopped playing for about five years. Um, and it wasn't until I started that I actually, you know, wanted to, you know, continue, uh, you know, involving myself, you know, with, with my faith. And, um, when I decided to make that, <clears throat> you know, do that for my life, follow mm-hmm. that, that road, that road, uh, is when I started getting back into music again. And it was because people did not have the skills or the knowledge to, you know, play live music or to even, you know, hook up a live sound system. And so I found myself, you know, all of a sudden I became the music guy at the church because I knew how to do everything from my, all my experiences participating with all these different skill levels of musicians and performing arts artists and stuff artists. I don't even want to call them. There was a time where me and Nick played for this organization called shout and they literally mm-hmm. paid us. They paid us. Okay. They pay. I'm going to tell you how this, we are. Oh gosh, man. I'll get some juicy details. All right. So <clears throat> we played for an organization called shout. And it was a nonprofit that w- there was people that sponsored it and they would cut us a check after a certain amount of performances, we would get money. We would get a hundred dollar check from this organization. And uh, we did it maybe two or three times that we got some money, but we were so corrupted. We spent it on booze and cigarettes cause we were, <laughs> we were terrible children. <laughs> mm-hmm. Oh my God. We're terrible children. Um, but yeah, and we there was other people that had different things like dance, choreography, rap, uh, poetry, stuff like that. People that participated with this group. Um, but yeah, that helped us too. We played at the grand opening of a Target one time because we participated with this with this performing arts nonprofit, and they paid us to do it. So it was fun. It was cool. Um, <clears throat> yeah. Anyways, so that le- lead, leads us to now. About three years ago. Um, I'm working at a hotel. Uh, this is a weird segment. Well, just a weird transition, but I work at now. You worked at where? I worked at now. Where you work at now. I worked at a hotel. I worked at the quality Inn in Santanella. I was working graveyards there. And this was a really cool job because it allowed me to have a lot of time in the day to do whatever I wanted. And at night you would just basically, you know, you'd look at the numbers on the credit cards and just make sure that there was balances that, you know, were all zeroed out at the end of the night. You know, you don't want people owing you money. You just would just do some quick, simple auditing and then you'd move on. That was it. That's really all your responsibility was check people in, check people out. Simple job. Um, and at that time, Alex, I ran into Alex because he was working. Where were you working at? At the travel center. He was working at the travel America. center. He was at the work. Like yeah. And, um, I think there was a couple of times where 
I don't know how it happened, but how the how we started talking again because we hadn't talked. We hadn't. I hadn't talked to you in maybe five, six years. You know. Yeah. Um. Well, I, I don't know exactly how it happened, but somehow we end up just have we just get end up getting lunch one day, right? We went to that Carl's Jr. right there and getting lunch. Right between us, yeah. Right Carl's Jr. is literally right between our works. <clears throat> right. We just be up there. Yeah, and um, at that time, I think you remember saying like you were just kind of done with wanting. You were just kind of done with, I guess. I don't know. I just being stuck there, I guess. And we just wanted an adventure when you were just like, I'm going to go to Korea. That's kind of yep. like, I just, I don't necessarily remember how it came up, but you just kind of, how you hit me with that. I was like, I'm just, I need to go. I was like, all right, <clears throat> well, that's cool, dude. Good for you. Go for it, bro. You do your thing. And, uh, I think we went on, I think we, we did a few more lunch dates, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> we meet up and, uh, just go get a cheeseburger or something. And, uh, and I was just like, yo, you know, I had been working for my church. Um, I had been working for a nonprofit and I'd also been working full time at the hotel at the time. And, um, man, these are all things I love to do. Okay. I love working for the church. A fun thing. I just like working with people now that, that give afforded me that opportunity and also working for the nonprofit. Um, as I worked with, I worked with students and, um, and that was a, an amazing opportunity where I learned a lot of things, um, to help me, I guess, I, I want to say like communicate, be a little bit more manageable about certain things. Hopefully, uh, it just gave me a little more professional edge, um, surrounding myself with certain people and being involved in that organization. It was just a, it, something fun to do anyway. So I felt like I just worked myself to the bone after five years of not participating in any sort of creative outlet, any sort of, sort of, you know, let me do me kind of thing because I was just wanted to be in service of others and stuff. Um, but, and I'm not saying that's the way I felt, but like, you know, at some point you need to take a break. And this is kind of where I was. I was sort of on my last thread with that too. I just need to take a vacation. And I think you felt you were kind of like that same place too. Yeah. And I was just like, yo, I'm going with you. I sort of just invited myself on your trip. I was like, I'm going, I'm going to go with you. And I got my passport before you. And then you're like, I'm going to go do it. And then I, that's when you got your passport. And then, um, then we bought our tickets cause they were cheap on sale. And I called you and you came over and we bought our tickets. Yep. That's right. Hey, you know, what's so funny, dude. I actually have, I actually have your, uh, I have your Wi-Fi password and server name, um, duct taped to the, uh, top of my old MacBook pro because that was a computer that I used to book my ticket on. Yeah, I don't yeah. actually have that Wi-Fi or Wi-Fi password anymore. Oh, man, so. well, anyways, well, I had it anyways. We had, we changed providers since then, but yeah, yeah, that's a memory. So it was, it was crazy, dude. Yeah, and then I think it was like around that time, we were just hanging out so much trying to organize our trip. I mean, talking about we booked everything in advance. All of our we everything our food was already half paid for so every place that we went we had food and a room to stay already paid for before we showed up so if we didn't eat dinner so what we were going to have breakfast and lunch covered no matter what because we everything was booked yeah. a, a year in advance we had planned this out pretty pretty uh, extensively uh two different hostels we spent uh, a little over a month in south korea so we were just kind of yeah, back and forth the- book the one-way ticket a one-way we're just ticket. Like, we'll come back when we when we run out of money because i at that time i told you i was like i don't know if i'm going to come back right yeah, exactly if something presents itself like an opportunity out there i'm going to take it and not come back and so like i mean you I did had everyone kind of mentally ready. yeah we did look we Nothing did like, he, like i mean i mean i'm talking about like resumes were submitted uh you know, at any place. I've been talking about like, Alex, this is a point where Alex, you kind of were just like, I'm done with whatever. I need to change something. I'm kind of just at a standstill, melting myself away, you know? Yeah. I don't know if you've ever felt like that because I felt like that before. You hit, you I kind of like hit a wall. Now. Well, I'm I, like that now. I need, I need a break. I need, need a break. Fly away from, from this yeah. place right now. You need something to just sort of kind but, of just like wake you up, right? Yeah. Too bad I can't leave right now because I know this pandemic, know. dude. Tell me about it. Jeez. But, but yeah, yeah that, it was it was pretty scary too because it's like we didn't know when we were gonna come back, and then like you just took a 
you didn't even quit your job. I quit my job. You I like just said, job. I'll be back when I back when I come back. <laughs> yeah. But the, well, the cool thing and, is my boss is my my, bo- my my bosses are Korean. They were Korean at the time, and um, they, they are, are super. They, they are, are well. I'm not. They're, I'm not employed by them, so um, they um, they are Korean, and um, they were so excited for me to get to go share a little bit of their culture. But um, yeah, they were super super supportive of me. And as a matter of fact, before I left, my boss gave me like a raise, like a month before I left, just so I can put a little bit more money in my pocket. Right. And then when I went, he said, Hey, I'm going to, he, he extended my, he gave me vacation pay for no reason. And he doesn't do that. He just kind of was just like, Hey, I gave you a little 200 extra dollars on your, your last check because, uh, you know, you're going on vacation. And this is a, this is a family owned independent, you know, owned a franchise, um, hotel. So, um, you know, what he did give me was, was, was more than more than what he could afford, you know. This is a privately owned establishment, so it's not like they're making dollars hand over fists that they could just give everybody the greatest thing. So to me, I appreciated it because you know I got to go on vacation. But anyways, um, so there I, I went on vacation. I had like maybe I, I think I had two credit cards with me, and I was like, "Yo, if anything goes sour, this is this is what I'm falling back on." And um, I had like. I think I had like one or two weeks of vacation pay available. And then I had like an, another, like one last check that was coming towards me. So I could, I kind of divvied up my pay a little bit to try and like go. Plus you have to take care of all your bills and everything still because going on vacation yeah. kind of sucks. You still got to pay bills if you're on vacation. So it, it, I just played my cards right to kind of, you know, take, do as long as I could go. And we stayed at hostels relatively cheap and stuff. It was fun. Um, but yeah, so we, and, uh, we we got down to. I remember we got down to the wire, and yeah. we're like, we plane tickets coming home. home. Yeah, plane tickets coming home was like the scary Dude, thing. I had the price was twenty dollars to my name. I had twenty dollars to my name when we got home. Yeah, no, I could I, was like, I could we, pay we for my ticket. Course. I just couldn't. I just couldn't pay for it in South Korea, so I couldn't like get the funds to do it like that way. I had to wait till I get home to the. It, in San Francisco to actually go to the bank and withdraw money because I couldn't do it in South Korea at one point. It was just some weird banking. I've always had issues with my cards. My wife is just like always on my case about this too. (laughs) Um, Anyways. So at that time when we decided to go, we were hanging out and we just, I just talking to you about a a project that I had uh, in my mind. um, A little, one of the riffs I wrote, which is now, um, the the main lead to our pretty much our single basically um little lion uh i had this I revised, but yeah it, like the heart of the riff yeah i had there. the heart of the riff was kind of just the pulse of it right the pulse of that of that the heartbeat of what the song was just kind of there and i told him that i wanted to call it um I don't know, some like, we wanted some sort of like American, like national, like weird. We wanted an American buffalo. Yeah. And we wanted like eagles and uh, what are their animals? Do we want to incorporate with it? We wanted to incorporate like um, elements of like the nature. Of just stuff. nature. Like one is the ground element. One is yeah. The like earth, North earth. American beasts was what we wanted the record to kind of like be one represented. Was buffalo, with. One was a bear, one was a bird and a one wolf. was like... I, Oh, like a rat or something. Yeah, something I can't something remember. Crazy. I can't remember what it was. Um, but they were all but but they were specifically species that were only that were native to North America though that we chose. We specifically we did that much research because <laughs> we were that weird. Yeah. Um and that slowly kind of grew into this project that you had sort of started, which was the Lions Among Men project. Yes. Yeah. But I remember when we were first going to Korea, I told you, like, you wanted to start making music and you wanted to basically make a band. And I told you, I didn't know if I was coming back. Well, but then right, when we yeah. came back, then, but we still like kind of talked about it, um, during the trip and stuff. And I remember we had one night in Itaewon where we were really drunk <laughs> sitting at a bench oh and then we just talked about it and we were just like, yeah, dude, let's start a band. We'll go, when we go back. You know, let's start a band. We were having, no, we were having an epiphany on a bench in ET1 after an all nighter. And I remember I was telling you, I was like, man, I'm just so lonely, crying myself to sleep. I was so (laughs) depressed at that time. Oh my goodness. I didn't want to to bring that one up. 
<laughs> no, I had to bring it up. No, okay, funny fact about this. When we went to... Uh, no, I won't bring it up. Anyways, but yeah, I was an emo kid. I was an emo kid. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. Right. And then when we came back and, you know, we had our first practice. Well, we decided, like, let's do this project. Let's see how it goes. We'll give it, like, a year. Yeah. Right? And, and then... Uh, it went, well, it, the first practice was not good. I remember our first practice was not good. Yeah. Because um, I didn't know where your skill level was. I haven't played in like same you didn't thing. Have like gear. Five you years. used half of my gear. I used half of your gear. All I had was yeah. a guitar. Like I had sold dirty most Belinda. of my stuff. I had good old Dirty Belinda. Dirty Belinda is a uh, what? What is it, Dirty Belinda? It's a it's a Telecaster Fender Telecaster. I call it the Dirty Belinda because that guitar for some reason likes to get very very dirty. I mean, like just it just the gets tone. The tones and are just they're super bitey that come out of that guitar. Yeah. And this is a made in Mexico yeah, Fender Telecaster, like two thousand seven, two thousand six. I want to say, but man, it was a it, it, that guitar still screams to this day. Yeah, still uh, Nick stock. Stockdale, <laughs> shout out. The one that got away, boy. The one that got away. <laughs> yeah, I traded that guitar for that for his Telecaster, which I have now. Uh, uh, that's fine. For me, it was a it was a net gain. For it him, was a, it net, was a gain. net loss. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. Because that guitar still sings. Because I remember I did a whole clean setup on it before we started playing again. And uh, man, yeah. I plugged that thing. It still sang. I think it was yeah, awesome. it's a good guitar. I I, I love that guitar. Um, so what yeah, are you playing, what are you playing right now? Not good. What? What are you What are you playing now, though? Like, what do you got now? What's the setup look like now? I have a a Fender Jazzmaster. The Fender Jazzmaster. What, what? What? Give me the rig rundown. Tell me what you're playing out of. So the so I'm playing a Jazzmaster. It's a Fender. It's my brand new baby. I love that thing. The thing it, it's a um, it's got jumbo frets on it, so it takes it's a while for me to still get used to the big frets. Yeah. Compared to going from a Telecaster small frets. Yeah. Uh, that's running into this brand new like pedal setup I got going on with um I bought a Lion Hit Lion Six Helix. That thing was I remember I was talking to you what for like a year that? about this thing. That's the big the big daddy, right? The big daddy, yeah. Not the not the floor. It's the it's the actual processing pedal yeah, yeah. for it. Um, it's, it has all the ant but, modelers in it. It has all the stomp box everything. modelers in it. It has cheese, everything you need. It has a, a, a pedal, an actual volume or wall pedal, whatever you want to set it to. Yeah, I could set it to whatever I want. Dude, so I remember I features. talked to you for a year for it. Talked to you all year about it, getting it. Yeah. And then what sold me is when I actually started building my pedal board. Do you remember the pedal board I had with like yeah. the, 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 the double barrel and all this yes. crazy stuff going? JHS double barrel. Had all these effects around going around it with the 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 M5 uh, and shit. The Fathom Walrus Audio yeah. with the Fathom. That was that's a good, really good pedal. Uh, has yeah, a shimmer, it went through a bunch. Of, has a shimmer yeah, on it. Was, that effect is amazing. I, and I was I was getting pissed off when we were actually practicing because like the songs require turning on and off multiple effects at the same time. Right. So I was tiptoeing so much and it was annoying me. Like I had to always rearrange pedals to like where it would flow better for me. Cause it's easy when you're sitting down, you can use both feet to turn stuff off. But when you're like standing and you need to turn multiple pedals off, you're just, you gotta be like, you know, not real toe fast. Right. Boom, 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 boom. So it's like what sold me was line hit uh, the helix. Um, because I was still on the fence about it because it was like $1,200. It's a big investment, right? And they released an update where they had snapshots. And it literally, every single pedal that you assign it to can have certain effects turned on. And then when you hit another one, it snaps to the different preset yeah. of those effects. And it shuts off the ones that were there. And then you can go more in depth where it could be the same thing like the same effects, but one has um, different settings. Yeah. And it'll automatically just switch to them. Yeah. And I was like, oh my God, that's it. And so I'm $1,200 while working. Solve it. the problem. <laughs> Solve my problem, dude. And I remember I brought it to your house to practice for the first time. Yeah. Ooh, God. It was beautiful. It was, and you're playing, dude, that, was, you're playing out of the set five amp that I had. It was a little yeah, tiny cheap out of that. You know, the funny yeah. thing about the set five amp is that my video review here. about it, 
my video review has the most views on that product on YouTube. Dude, I still have it here. I still I, I sometimes use it, but that's when no one's home. But everyone's home now, so I don't I don't like playing when everyone's home. Wow. But um, is it crazy? Yeah, now it cr- it's a good little amp. It just can't keep it could compete with your amp, and um, I'm the lead. So <laughs> yeah, that's true. It just it's 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 only I think it's only five watts or something like that. It's a tiny. It's only a yeah. ten inch speaker. It's a it's an all tubed amp. It's it's a beautiful little thing. It's super cheap. You can get on Amazon. I, when it was me and Luke, it cranks. But when yeah. it's me, you, and Luke, it doesn't crank. Yeah, that's true. Because at that point, I had a I had a Vox AC30 VR, which is the valve reactor. It's the half solid state, half tube. Um, and at that time, and I had a simple pedal setup. Well, I think I had about nine pedals, and I'm not. That wasn't simple, but um, but they were all. It was all dirty, uh, dirty power on it. You know, daisy chained, all terrible, and just tons of feedback. Um, but you know, I had a few earthquakers that just feedback all day because they were just super analog, but it's fun. I like that tone. I wanted it. Right. And so that's kind of how we started with our gear. And then I was playing in the, I have a Fender, I have a Fender, uh, it's a, I think it's made in Thailand. I'm not sure, but it's a Fender, uh, modern player, uh, semi hollow body. And it has those P90 styled, um, pickups in it. Um, Telecaster, yeah, it's a it's a it's a beautiful guitar. It looks amazing. I love it. It's not American or Mexican made, but you know, a relative a decent price. And then uh, I also had my custom made uh, Squire Telecaster that I hot rodded myself with P with a uh, that one has um, that one has the P90s. Now I'm sorry. Yep. Yeah. <clears throat> I'm sorry. Yeah. And uh, I had that one too as my backup going. And those were all those were active, so I had to put the battery in it. Um, but that I think was sort of kind of the beginning, and we knew that we want to really. I guess direction was the thricey tone, right? Is kind of like the the influence that kind of what we wanted to sort of mimic or follow a little bit, or were inspired by, not necessarily mimic. I think it was more inspired because I don't think we talked about it. genres. We didn't really. I, talk I about wanted genre, it, right? I wanted it to be very open, and we can write whatever we wanted. Yeah, if we wanted right something that has like lo-fi and if you wanted to like hip-hop to it you could yeah but like be very open with it and um i think it just i just kind of wrote that first riff and it would put it together and then you kind of went with it i just sort of kind of laid a little quick foundation you saw it you kind of like picked up on the pattern and you continued writing with it and then you came back yeah. we practiced several times we would record our practices with our phone just a simple recording during the practice where we'd write new pieces and then you would take that back and actually tab it out on which program on uh guitar pro on guitar i tab pro. it all out wow. it was rough listening to it sometimes because like this is my older phone, audio like, recording speaking. yeah it was like it, it was very muffled and sometimes it would crack like it peaked really bad so you'd tap it out on Guitar Pro. And then after that, you would make this just a, a simple rendering, digital rendering of how the song would sound if we had more than just the two parts that we'd worked on in the garage. The arrangement with the drums, yeah. the bass, the guitars, you know, and melodies or something like that, a lead. Uh, we would, You would do that. You'd bring it back to practice and you would show me the pieces and be like, hey, this is going to be your part. I'll stick to this part, okay? And then we were able to clearly define our roles in the songs. So the practice, we were actually able to practice our parts. So I actually think the system of how we kind of wrote those songs was effective because it, it was, it, we're able to do it over distance and over a long period of time, which is more effective for me time wise. Um, yeah. and, and we can sit on it because we have the records of what we've put together, right? Yeah, yeah. We have so, the records. I, I I need to find them because I think I would, might have deleted all of them. No, I have I have I have the audio. I have the the pre record. I just have the I have the open air recordings of those practices uh, on my on my phone. Yeah, so. I, I think I have some of them on my drive. But. Yeah, but yeah, but being able to do that has been kind of cool because now that uh, I've you know we put together this podcast, I have some of the equipment that we can continue working on this project now. So now, Mm -hmm. now we can continue, uh, where we left off because we, we started this project three years ago. We put together some rough cuts of a lot of things or Alex did, and he did a lot of this work himself, um, arranging everything and putting it together, giving us some skeletons, digital 
you know, variations of the mm-hmm. songs. And then some of them, some of the songs he's actually gone through and recorded his pieces and pieces for. So it's a little bit of a, of a Frankenstein where it's, you know, half of it's done digitally. The other half's done like it's actually him, you know, playing his guitar. So uh, there's a little bit of that. And then now hopefully one of the tracks we're hope we're working on lyrics right now. We're trying to get that together so we can actually post it for you guys and see what you guys think because we just want to share it, you know, yeah. um, that's the next step that we're at. And yeah, so we're looking forward to that. That'll be fun. Yeah. Oh, there's my, my dog Russ in the background. Hey, yo, Good Russ. Russ. Hey, yo, Russy boy. That's my baby boy. My monkey baby boy. That's what I call my dog Russ on my monkey baby boy. Yeah. I have an intimate relationship with him. He's like my child. <clears throat> if you follow me on Instagram, you know. My dog is like my yeah. child. <laughs> um, anyways, yeah. Uh, my brother joined the group. My brother joined, right? After we started writing the project, he uh, he kind of came on board as, a, as just a session drummer for us. He kind of come into practice and, you know, practice live with us, rehearse with us a little bit. And, you know, the goal is always to keep my brother involved, but we need to figure out how we can... Uh, capture his his parts which i think would be more difficult to record guitar or to, to i'm not sure about this if you guys are audio engineers out there you know you guys might be able to give us some feedback on how we can capture you know or record my brother's drum set uh diy version of that i haven't looked into that um but we can obviously record our guitar parts already and our, our actual vocals but I don't really know anything about recording drums. So if you're an audio engineer or somebody who is a DIYer who records their own drums and you want to help us out, um, send us an email at um, averagefellas at gmail.com. Averagefellas at gmail.com helps out. Uh, Yeah. Hey, uh, I think we talked about a lot today. Yeah, we did. We did talk about a lot, man. Oh, my God. We're almost going on two hours, bro. Oh God! Can we end it? Yeah, we're gonna end it. We're gonna close it up, guys. Um, hey, the cool thing about this episode, the way we wanted to end this day is a little different. Uh, I don't know if you guys seen it, but earlier this week, I or last week, I teased our us practicing our new sign off because we're actually using the uh, the music audio from uh the lions among men project to do our sign off so you guys can get a little bit of a of a audio teaser get your as his ears wet real quick for our little audio commotion that we're about to create i guess so that's- yeah it was, it was it was fun working on it because it's like we had to know what parts we wanted to use because it's not the full song yeah um a lot got a lot got cut um so it fits a little better. Yeah. But um, yeah, if you wanted to hear the full song, it's on Bandcamp for Lions Among Men. Um, like I said, I think I said it in the last episode, the last few episodes that um, you don't actually have to pay anything. You just put zero dollars and then you click um, uh, just send me the email and then it'll, it'll send you the email for the song so you can download the MP3. Yeah. So you can listen to it. But um, yeah. Yeah. Hey, um, real quick, guys, before we actually uh, do our do our sign off with the new outro, remember, you guys can uh, check us out on all the podcast platforms, Apple, Spotify. Hey, guys, review, like, subscribe, all those good things that helps us out. Um, and we appreciate your guys listens. We want some feedback. So don't be afraid to leave us a comment, you know, check out our Twitter, all that good stuff. Anyways. Uh, um, yeah, here it goes. Here we go. Yeah. This is it. This is how we end the. This is how we end the episode, bro. It's gonna be the new ending. This is the we'll new ending. We'll, we'll get the ending. Yeah. Somehow, some way, we're gonna get this ending oh, down. Man. Um. Yeah. yeah that's. Oh wait, I was supposed to do all that. You know. Hey, check us out on Twitter Darn stuff it. right now, right? Oh my gosh, I'm so embarrassed. What do you say? I just ruined our first official sign off. For the Average Fells podcast with the new outro. Yeah. I guess I'm just an average fella after all, huh? Mm-hmm. Hey, Moon, uh, do me a favor. Why don't you just uh, take it away, bud? Take it away with what? Something. The same. Same. Peace. See you. Catch you later. <laughs>